engineers and designers who build and deploy the tools that are used by 160,000 employees across the company. So we definitely have a lot of ground to cover and it's a lot of fun to tell stories and listen to them on a day-to-day -day basis. And on the side, I'm also a writing consultant and I work with professionals, small business owners and students and help them tell stories about their identity and work. So in short, writing is really the heart and soul of what I get to do professionally and personally. And I'm excited to share some of the tips that I've learned throughout my career. I also really love questions and engagement. And I encourage you to use the chat as a place to drop things that you're curious about and share what resonated with you because you never know what might catch somebody else's eye. And it also helps me know what kind of content to keep making. So if you're here, I'm guessing that you probably value storytelling, but maybe some of you need a little bit more convincing. And these are some of my personal philosophies about storytelling. The first is that everybody, literally everybody on this call and beyond, has a story to tell. And we're always telling stories about who we are or what we do. Even if you think about the last time you went to the grocery store and someone asked you what you were up to today, or whenever someone asks what you do for a living, even that micro interaction is an opportunity to tell a story. And more than just your typical storytelling, I believe that strategic storytelling is a differentiator. And this is your ability to not just say that you are a writer or an engineer or a marketer, but really going deep into how you solve problems and the perspective that you bring to the table. This is something I talk to a lot of young professionals about because they say, I've applied to all these jobs and I don't feel like I'm standing out among the crowd. When you're a strategic storyteller, you can really sell the unique value that you bring and the fact that they should hire you versus everybody else. And most fundamentally, I think that good storytelling requires vulnerability. You want to transport your audience to the moment you're sharing. And oftentimes, you do have to share parts of yourself that you might not be used to. And it's something that takes practice, but I hope I can leave you with some strategies to do this successfully. One of the most fundamental questions that I ask every client or person I'm interviewing is what do you want people to remember about you? What about your story should stand out to them after you've connected with someone at a networking event or just interviewed for a job? How should they see you and what do you want them to know? And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you how what I answer this question through a particular example. So this is Lizelle. As you can tell by her stoles and her cords, at the time she was a recent grad, but it was kind of a tumultuous time. It's, it was 2020, and with the pandemic, I think everything was feeling a little bit more uncertain. I'm sure a lot of you have been in that boat as well. She was on her way to interview for her dream role as a diagnostic ultrasound tech, and she wasn't feeling confident in her story. She just interviewed for a previous role and not gotten it, and she really came to me because she wanted to feel like she could sell the story that only she knew. And so as I started to dig deeper and I asked her why she did what she did, she kind of explained the typical components of being somebody in healthcare. She talked about talking with patients and getting their medical history, rooming them, ensuring that they got referred. But I didn't feel like this really captured who she was. And during our meetings, I started to ask, what is your why? In your case, why are you in healthcare and how do you approach each conversation with patients? And in this moment, I felt like I really got to see who she was because she immediately looked at me and said, that's really easy. When I am talking to patients, I want them to feel like they are the only patient that matters and that they can feel safe in telling me what they need. There's so much uncertainty in the world, pandemic or not, and I want to make them feel like they're cared for and that I'm attentive to their needs. And when she went to interview for the role, she really highlighted that empathy-centered approach. So thankfully, this is a happy story. She was not only able to land the job, which was a really big deal for her, but one of her supervisors later came to her and said that she gave one of the strongest interviews that they've ever seen. I think this is also a testament to the fact that you, of course, want to have your technical chops, whether you're a writer or a marketer or a developer, but you also wanted to be able to explain your story and your strengths and get people on board to working with you and the perspective that you bring. And even more importantly, she was more confident in her story. And I hope that by the end of this talk, you also feel like you have more confidence and guidelines about how you can tell your story on an everyday basis. 
So in terms of the agenda, we're going to start with an overview of personal branding and how that connects to storytelling. Talk about my framework for storytelling, which is around telling a short, medium, and long story. And last, some tips and tricks for crafting stories that I've learned from my work as a journalist and a writer. And one of the most fundamental stories we tell about ourselves is an introduction. So when you're asked to introduce yourself, what do you say? And in particular, who are you outside of work and school? This scenario really came full circle for me when I was interviewing to be in a video about my relationship with makeup. So I made it to the final round and I'm talking with the director. And she says, I want to get a sense of who will be in the room when we're talking about this topic. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? And honestly, I froze because I'm so used to saying that I'm a writer in tech, you know, leading with my company and my job. And I realized that that's not really what she wanted to know. She wanted to know the kind of person I am, the values that I have, the problems that I solve, and how would that inform the conversations we were going to have. And so in this moment, I really had to dig deep and figure out what I wanted her to know about me as a fully formed person. And when you're telling stories, I know that it can be really hard, especially if you don't consider yourself a storyteller, but I believe that everybody is an expert in their own experiences. And when you're in a moment like this, whether you're introducing yourself or you're at a networking event and you want to make a good impression, in the words of Andrew Stanton, draw from what you know. It doesn't always mean plot or fact. It means capturing truth from you experiencing it, expressing values you personally feel deep down in your core. And I think Andrew Stanton's really speaking to the fact that we all might have overlap in the problems that we solve or the work that we do, but only we can speak our own truth. There's so much power in owning your narrative and feeling like you can tell it when you need to. So here is an exercise that you can try out the next time you're asked to introduce yourself. And just as a marker, if you see this check mark, it's essentially an exercise that you can take note of and try for yourself after this session. So here are a couple different frameworks. The first one is to share your purpose. So like I mentioned, you can share the kinds of problems that you're solving for at work or at school, or who and what you advocate for. So for example, I have a friend who works at this company called Code Society. And when I talked to him about his work, he said that he's trying to make software development education more accessible by incorporating hip hop elements into the curriculum. So that way it really centers BIPOC community so they feel like software development is relevant for them and that it's also really fun. But if he just said that he was a curriculum developer or supported software development, you might not capture that rich story and his mission and values. Another approach is to share a passion project that you're working on. I know with quarantine, maybe you've picked up a new hobby or project. For me, honestly, one of my hobbies has been trying to speak more and come up with some topics that I feel really strong about and sharing my expertise so everybody can feel like they're a storyteller too. And last, lead with curiosity by mentioning something that you're reading or learning about and how you discovered it. I have a really good friend at Microsoft named Leah Shin, and she is always writing about the next technology that is the future. So she recently wrote about AR and VR filters, and lately she's been exploring Clubhouse as an audio-only platform that facilitates conversation and connection. So whatever is interesting to you, even if it's not necessarily your day job or the company that you work for, these are really great opportunities to get people a glimpse into your world and hopefully find some common ground so you can connect and talk further. So that is your intro, which is great, of course. We, we love owning our narrative. But then there's this other piece, personal branding. And if I were to distill it down, I would say personal branding is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And this could answer the question like, what, uh, what can others count on you for? And what are the skills or strengths that you bring to every project? And you might be saying, okay, Alina, how am I supposed to know what other people say about me? Maybe you only have a quarterly reflection or you're not always getting verbatim feedback. And that's okay. I have an exercise that you can try from Katie McBratney, who's the chief brand officer of Own Trail. I'm sure some of you on this call know her or have worked with her. And this is a distilled version. She actually has some really great talks going into more depth. 
So if you're trying to figure out where your personal brand is right now, the first thing that you can try is to take inventory of your current experiences. Maybe this could be going through your resume, your portfolio, your LinkedIn, and distill down the key themes and objectives into a singular phrase. I know that's really hard um, and it doesn't have to be perfect, but try to distill it down into something that feels authentic to you. So for me, I would say that I get to tell stories on an everyday basis and I'm empowering others to feel more confident in their own story. At least that's how I would describe it. And if you have an idea of your personal brand, at least how it exists right now, I'd love for you to share it in the chat. I'm curious to see if there's any overlap between how you would describe it and others who might know you would say. So once you have that phrase, go to four to six people in your network or community and ask them to describe your brand and what they can count on you for. And you can make this really easy by even creating a Google form or a Microsoft form, whatever technology you prefer, and send it out and you'll have all the responses in one place. And once you have those outputs, compare them and find patterns. And then you can update your portfolio and your LinkedIn and your bio to reflect the values of your work and brand. Ideally, it will kind of land in the center. And hopefully what people are saying is indicative of the way that you describe yourself, but maybe some new language. So for example, uh, one, I work with uh, somebody who's an entrepreneur who focuses on empowering women and people of color to advocate for themselves at work. That's how she described her brand. But when she did this exercise, she found that a lot of people associated her with feminism and women empowerment specifically. And that was really interesting to her. And as she created content going forward, she would try to incorporate those elements more explicitly or implicitly. So keep in mind that your personal brand is always changing, but it's helpful to get a pulse of it at any given moment and know that it can change in four to six months if you're looking for a new job or you take on a new endeavor. So once you have a tenant of your personal brand or maybe a couple components, I think one of the easiest places to make this show up is your LinkedIn profile. And if you prefer Twitter or you have other platforms, it could be wherever that bio shows up. So for me, I mentioned that I'm a content program manager and writer since that's my job, but you can also see other elements of my brand and my work. I mentioned that I'm a speaker and a mentor and that I studied human-centered design and engineering because that empathetic approach, listening and asking without assumptions is really rooted in what I studied. For someone like Miri Rodriguez, she is an expert in brand st storytelling so much that she even wrote a book about it. So you can see that reflected as the first thing in her headline. But then you also see other keywords that I would also associate with her. She's a storyteller. She's rooted in her community as a mom, a speaker, and a volunteer. And she also has a role at Microsoft supporting interns around the world, hence global head of internships. So once you feel like you have a handle on your brand in this given moment, I encourage you to at least draft up a bio and put it in a place that feels like it'll get a lot of visibility. And you know that you can iterate on it over time, but you want to give yourself a starting point. So now that we've talked about personal branding, let's talk about how you can craft a short, medium, and long story. And I'll give you a little bit more detail about what that looks like. And this is something I believe about any story, whether you're writing your bio on LinkedIn or a long form article. You think of your story like a cake and you build it from the ground up. You need a very strong foundation where you set that context. And then from there, you can appreciate the richness of details that come after. And in this metaphor, I would say that the foundation is your bio or your elevator pitch. That's the story where you kind of distill who you are, your brand, and your work. So this is what I would recommend including in your bio, at least as a starting point. But if there's things that are relevant to your field or your identity, you can always add those in. So in a bio or foundational story, the first thing, of course, is to explain your job or your day-to-day -day work, whatever that looks like. Again, highlighting the problems that you solve and who you advocate for. That's a way to make that story about what you do so much more rich than just a job title. The second and the differentiator is the lens that you bring to your work. So maybe you are a marketer, but you're committed to inclusion by always featuring BIPOC folks or people with disabilities in your campaigns. Or maybe you're a PM who's really great at building relationships across developers and designers. 
or you're a software engineer who prioritizes innovation and ensures that the code and the resources that you create can be reused by future teams. Even though small shifts in language can show, can show others how you do your job in a very unique and specific way. And oftentimes this is the thing that will get you hired. And then third, humanizing yourself by sharing a bit about what you do outside of work or how you like to spend your time. And I'll show you what this looks like for me. So you've seen examples of this through my intro, but when I'm asked about my day-to-day -day work, I share that I'm a writer for Microsoft Inside Track, and in this role, I function a lot like a journalist who gets the inside scoop from engineers and PMs who build, deploy, and maintain Microsoft technology. But in terms of the approach, I would say that I'm really good at building and bridging creativity and strategy. So I'm equal parts writer, creative problem solver, and journalist. But the heart of my work is really being rooted in the stories of people behind code and user interfaces. Although my stories might drive sales at the end of the day, the goal is to create a space where people can really share why they're excited about the work and hopefully get readers excited to try out that technology for themselves. And in terms of humanizing myself and sharing my why, I'm a Pakistani woman in tech, and I believe that you can't be what you can't see. In other words, representation is everything. And that's why I make a really deliberate commitment to ensure that folks of color, especially BIPOC folks, folks with disabilities, and LGBTQIA people are featured in my writing and that they have the visibility that comes with being in my stories, whether they're for Microsoft or not. And although this is a pretty short bio, it kind of gives you a surface level look at me. I do think that it gives you a pretty good sense at who I am, how I approach my work, and the skills that I bring to the table. And this is really foundational to any other story that I tell about myself. Once you understand these things, then we can go deeper into why I explore the roles that I do or what I want out of my career and my life. So that is the short story. Like I said, that's the foundational story. So let's talk about how you would build on that if we're gonna continue with this cake metaphor. So in a medium length story, this would be where you have more time to clarify some things that you've brought up in your bio. Maybe this could be a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one, or if you're being interviewed for a piece and you can go deeper on your processes and your process and your values, ideally through an example. So I had mentioned that I'm deeply rooted in the stories of people behind code and user interfaces. And I could tell you about a story that really exemplified that. So for example, I recently wrote a blog about this Yammer community. Yammer is an internal communications tool at Microsoft that was created to ensure that visa dependent employees were staying up to date about the US immigration climate, which is always volatile, but was particularly volatile under the last administration. And so the group that founded this Yammer community really wanted to cut through the noise and make people feel supported and connect them with the right information. And so when I would talk about this in interviews, I was quick to share how this aligned with my values because I think it's a great story about using tech for good and how technology can really make people feel more connected and how that's one of my values. So you're able to kind of go deeper and really show with not tell, not just tell. Then we have the long story. This could be a long form article or blog, or if you make it to the final stage interview for a company, you might have multiple rounds. And in that case, of course, you're still telling stories about yourself through examples, but you want to connect those stories back to what makes you successful in your role, in your field and in your career path. So for example, I just shared the story that I told you when I interviewed at another tech company. And one thing I did to ensure that I was going into more depth was connecting it with the success metrics of writers in tech. I talked about how writers are really good at building relationships with folks across disciplines. So that way they're not only bought into the story idea, but that they wanna amplify it in the end, because we all know that content is only as successful as the amount of people who read and find it. And I talked about my process for building those relationships over time and connected it to my long-term goal of being a creative director. So all of these components of these stories, there's things that you probably know about yourself and that you've told in one form or another, but you're kind of building those connections along the way, ensuring that they have that context about you so they can appreciate those deeper level insights and values. 
So I just talked about this example, but um, so I'm going to skip this one for now. Okay, so now that we've talked about personal branding and how to craft your story, I want to share some tips and tricks that I've learned as a writer over the years. I think one of the most important parts before you even start writing is to identify the purpose of the story that you're telling. And again, I said the story you're writing, this could be the story that you're telling, the story you're putting on your LinkedIn or your portfolio, et cetera. So maybe your talk is intended to inspire. I'm sure some of you on this call have done TEDx talks, keynotes, led morale events. And in this case, you want to invite the audience to learn more or maybe even think differently about a topic. I remember a few years ago, I went to a TEDx talk that I really enjoyed, and it was all about finding novelty in everyday things, that it's very easy to be stuck in a routine, but when we prioritize novelty and bring it into our lives, we end up having a lot more joy. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Because there's hundreds of thousands of TED and TEDx talks, but the ones that really resonate and the ones that we see get picked up are inviting us to look at things we know in a slightly different way. Or maybe as a keynote, you wanna get people excited about the idea of innovation and bringing people together in community. In another case, you might be trying to educate your audience, which is the case for a workshop like this or a training. And you want to teach your audience a new skill, framework, or mindset with a clear call to action. So as I was developing this deck, I was thinking about how I could introduce concepts, but of course have exercises that you could try after the fact that were pretty accessible. And then lastly, maybe your goal is to persuade your audience. This is especially popular if you're presenting to leadership or managers. I'm sure folks in tech have done this as well when you're presenting a new feature or you're trying to get more budget or resources. And I think one thing that really helps in this case is to identify the decision maker in the room and understand how they prefer to receive information. So some leaders really need that verbatim feedback from customers. They want to know customers are really interested in this feature and here's how many times we've seen them in our listening systems. In other cases, some leaders just want the data. They want metrics about how this feature that you're proposing increases efficiency or how you'd able to use that additional headcount to do more in your role. So whatever that, in, whatever person you need to influence, that will inform the way that you give your talk. And maybe you're doing a couple of these components at the same time, but I do think it helps you scope your content. And these are some quick takes that I apply in every single story that I tell. The first one, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this, is that having a hook is key because you want to use it to bring your audience into your world. I know that in the age of TikTok, people's attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. And I always joke with my coworkers that we write to an audience that doesn't read, or in this case, that they prefer multiple ways to engage with content, which is why my team has embraced video, for example. And so if you have to write your whole piece and then come back to the hook, I think that's totally normal. But once you have that story you want to tell, ask yourself, how can I bring the reader into this world and really excite them so they they are they want to read more, but that I've also piqued their interest and ensured that it's relevant to them. Another tip that is really pertinent to me, especially as a writer in tech, is to take feedback seriously, but not personally. I know I get a lot of feedback all the time about, you know, my professional identity and the stories I tell. And I've been called everything from in unfocused to extremely creative and precise. And, you know, all of that feedback is valid, but I always take everything that I hear and evaluate. Is this relevant to me? Do I understand this person's intention versus impact? So whenever you get feedback from a peer, from a manager, from a stakeholder, I invite you to understand their intent, and take it seriously, of course, but then evaluate if it makes sense for you to address in whatever you're making. And then lastly, make sure that you include the most pertinent details in your story and delete everything else. And I know it's heartbreaking sometimes when you spend hours writing a headline or a story or you think you have an example for a job interview and then you realize it's actually not that pertinent to the question. 
And I think at that point, you have to delete it for the sake of focus. We call this killing your darlings in writing. And if it's any consolation, one thing that I'll do is I have an overflow, an overflow document where I'll put extra text that didn't quite make it into that final story or LinkedIn or portfolio, but it's still there in case I want to use that information in the future. But this ensures that you're telling the most focused story possible, and maybe that information will come back around when it's more relevant. And I think what matters most, whether you're drafting a story for your bio, for an upcoming talk, for a chat with your manager, it's to get that first draft on paper. Once you have something to start with, you can refine and you can iterate, but I really challenge you to get started, especially if you're here and storytelling is something that matters to you. I can guess that there's a story on your heart that you want to tell. And so even it could be as simple as putting 20 minutes on your own calendar and drafting it out or writing out bullet points that you want to cover. And once you have a starting point, you'll be able to take it from there and get feedback or share it. But if you don't ever manifest it into existence, it's hard to go any further. And believe me, I know first drafts are hard, but it will honestly pay off in the end once you have something that you can do something with. So this is an exercise that you can also try if you feel like you have a story that you want to tell, but you're not exactly sure where to start. Maybe you need some support. And as a journalist, I can really vouch for interviews as a place to understand yourself or someone else more deeply. So set up time with someone that you trust. You could also even record yourself if that feels more comfortable. Introduce yourself and share a draft of the story that you're working on. And if you haven't gotten that far, maybe you can share the idea that you want to communicate. From there, have the other person ask you questions. It could be, why are you sharing this story now? What are the most important details? What do you want people to remember? And one phrase that I find helpful is, tell me more. So you mentioned that inclusion and making feel, people feel represented in your story is really important. Tell me more about why that matters to you. Have you seen yourself represented in the media that you've consumed? And even in asking those questions and thinking about them or figuring out where you kind of hit a wall, I assure you that you'll get closer to figuring out what story you actually want to tell. And you can start to fill in those gaps. Maybe you share your story and somebody says, well, I actually know that this is important to you because I've known you your whole life. You've always tried to tell stories about, you've always tried to tell stories where you see yourself represented because you didn't have those growing up. And I think you should talk about how that affected you. And in that conversation, in that reflection, you can fill in the gaps and ensure that your story is closer to what you want to communicate. So here are some quick strategies that you can use to track stories on an ongoing basis. And I say this because with storytelling, it's not just one and done. It's something that we're always doing and we're always iterating on it. So especially for folks in tech, um, but I'm sure there's also other disciplines that apply us to, can you find ways to quantify your impact in addition to all those verbatim responses in those stories? In the words of Brian McKenna, don't just tell me you did user research. Tell me the results of that research. How many key insights did you find? How many recommendations did you offer? And in this case, you can see that although you might explain some of those more storytelling moments about what you discovered, it is also important to quantify that and show how far you've gotten and make sure that you're really influencing stakeholders who need this information. I recommend measuring what's most impactful or more pertinent to your field. So for me as a writer, the things that I'm often looking at is number of deliverables, page views, clients, and like I had mentioned before, I have leaders who really care about this information. If I tell a stakeholder that their story got 10,000 views in the first three weeks and we have a lot of questions, then they might be more likely to work with me and follow up with the story. In other cases, maybe if you're a researcher or a software engineer, you might be moved by verbatim and survey feedback from collaborators or from users. So if users are saying, I'm not able to access this feature because I use assistive technology and it doesn't support that, 
perhaps you could use that verbatim feedback to advocate for accessibility as something being built in. Or if you have a lot of feedback or questions on a certain topic from customers, then you can use that as a part of your story to advocate for that change. Another thing that I think really helps is to focus on the delta or the change. So if you worked on something, can you tell a story about how you increased usage of a product or sales? Or did you create a process that decreased support calls by 30% over time? And if you're able to articulate not only what changed, but the role that you played in that, I guarantee that you'll be able to influence people a lot more to be bought into the value of your work. And then lastly, um, I recommend creating a smile file or a place that you can document your wins. And of course, this is a great place to track memorable feedback from collaborators and customers. But honestly, I think that it's also a good morale boost for you as well. Because I know sometimes we have days where we might be asking ourselves, why do I do what I do? Is this really the right place for me, the right job, the right opportunity? And I've used my smile file to remind me that I'm in the business and the work that I love. You can see this screenshot here that's from over five years ago at this point. It was one of the first art I ever wrote as a journalist. And the person said, this is probably the best written and best presented article I have seen produced about my work over the last 16 years. And honestly, I, I continue to think about this message even though it was so long ago that something I had written could impress somebody, somebody so respected um, in the field of research. And it reminds me that I love being a writer and that I really have a strong ability to make complex things simple. And so if you have a file where you can put all this information, that ensures that you won't lose it if you, for example, lose access to an email or you move jobs. But it also makes it easy for you to open it and just smile a little bit to remember the impact that you've had over time. And then lastly, Iterate, iterate, iterate. Your stories like you are always evolving and it's okay to adjust as you go. The stories that you tell about the work that you do or the jobs that you want, it's okay if they shift over time. I've talked to so many folks who are in the middle of a career pivot or are telling their story again to get into grad school or to move and make time for you to engage in that regular reflection. One thing that I do is I'll set up regular time on my calendar every month and I can block it out and it's a reminder for me to go back through my LinkedIn and my resume and my smile file. So that way I'm really centered in the work that I want to do. And honestly, it's hard to do this if you don't have some kind of push, whether it's an upcoming evaluation or a job. So make that time for yourself. And I promise it's a lot easier to reflect on those stories in the moment in an ongoing basis versus right at the end of an experience. So with storytelling, I would say that practice makes perfect. And if I were to leave you with two action items or challenges, the first one would be to commit to telling your story in whatever way is authentic to you. You could write a post on LinkedIn, you could write an article, you could set up a one-on-one -on -one with someone that inspires you. And a question that I'll often ask myself when I'm telling a story is, what's something I think about a lot that no one else talks about? So for example, it's Ramadan now, and I remember this time last year, I wanted to write about what it was like to fast during a global pandemic and trying to find a sense of community when I couldn't physically be with my family and a lot of the people in my community. And for you, I would guess that there is a story on your heart or something that you want to share. And so put it out there, share it with somebody that you trust or put it out online and see what happens. But if you don't put something out into the world, then you don't give others the opportunity to interact and resonate with it. And of course, it also helps to find people that inspire you. So follow the storytellers, content creators, or people in your field and engage with their content or draw inspiration from it. I remember I went to an event with somebody on the LinkedIn news team and she talked about how every morning she spends 30 minutes commenting and engaging on posts from folks that inspire her. And in that way, even sharing her perspective and adding on to existing conversations, that's a form of storytelling and a way for you to connect with like-minded folks and for people to find out more about your work. So whatever it is, whether it's finding more people who are telling stories that resonate with you or sharing your own content, 
I hope that you go forth with a little bit more confidence and some frameworks that you can apply for storytelling. And I can't wait to see what stories you tell. So I would love to stay in touch with all of you. Um, and I also, if there's something that resonated with you from this talk, one thing that you're taking away, please share it in the chat. And I would love to connect with all of you on social. My LinkedIn is here. I'm pretty much Alina Ansari on all platforms. And my email is also listed if you want to talk one on one. Thank you so much, Alina, for that incredible talk. I think I love the part where you spoke about the smile part. I've never really thought about that piece. And I think that's one thing I, I definitely want to start doing. But, you know, um, while everybody's just putting their questions in the chat box, I, I definitely want to uh, take a minute to uh, ask you how, you know, how did you get started on the journey, especially uh you know, what was your process like when you were getting into Microsoft and how did you start yeah. talking your your story? Uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, people during, you know, uh, when, when they're starting off, when they're looking for their jobs and, you know, yeah. uh, are going through the job search process, um, it's often very confusing, like what kind of story they should be telling. So mm -hmm. what was your process like? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I got into Microsoft first as an intern when I was in college. Um, and something that I had done my whole undergraduate career was write stories first as a journalist. And then I found a couple different publications that I could write for. And I realized that what I loved most was, like I had mentioned, doing interviews and creating space for people to tell their story with authenticity. But another part that I really loved was making complex things simple. So when I was in college, I wrote for this neural engineering research center and all of their work was so complex and innovative. And my job as their communications intern was try to make it accessible to a broad audience. And so I loved technology and the work that they were doing, but I wanted everyone to be able to understand it. And so I remember a few months into my junior year of college, I was kind of thinking about breaking into tech, but I wasn't sure how. And I logged onto the Microsoft site and they had one internship position open and it was for a writing role. And I remember seeing the bullet that you're a writer and storyteller who loves empathy and making information accessible. You lead with impact, you center the needs of your users um, and that you prioritize innovation. And I honestly did a double take. I didn't know that writers in tech existed, but I had confidence that all the skills that I had been doing as a journalist and as a writer prepared me for that moment. So it was a little bit of luck to find what I wanted, but I think when I went into that interview and my final round, I remember that I had a lot of conviction in the value of my transferable skills. So I explained that although I hadn't really grown up in the tech industry or around it, I believe that technology is something that we have a privilege to access and that it can make our life better if used right. And as a writer, I wanted to really get people bought into not only using this technology, but understanding who built it and what motivated them. So having that kind of conviction in my story, but also articulating how it connected to the industry that I wanted made a really big difference. And I'm, I'm honestly so glad that I found the discipline that I'm in, because I don't think people realize that writers in tech exist. There's actually a lot of roles in tech that are not just software engineering or being a PM. Oh, I can't hear you. I don't know if I... Can you, oh. can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I can. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, my, my question was that, you know, this is a great segue into our next question, which is essentially, you know, you spoke about empathy. Do you have any tips on how to write emotionally centered stories? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think when it comes to writing with empathy, like especially about yourself, I think the goal is to ask yourself, how do you want the reader to feel or what do you want them to understand through reading your talk? Um, I think a lot of times empathy and vulnerability, especially vulnerability, gets a bad rap. Like when we think about being in the tech industry or being at work, we don't always get to share who we are and what motivates us. And so if you want to lead with empathy, you want people to understand what motivates you to tell that story, to do the work that you're doing. And a lot of times it's soul searching to ask yourself, where does this desire come from? 
So I had mentioned that I'm a writer in tech. And for me, it was realizing that when I was growing up, I didn't see a lot of BIPOC folks, especially Pakistani folks, being featured in stories of innovation about technology. And I thought maybe I could be the one to change that. I didn't grow up seeing folks looking like me, but maybe I could be the one to write them or to amplify them and create the representation that I knew that I needed. And so that's a way that I tap into my empathy. My, it was my desire to feel represented that motivates me to do the work that I do. And for you, it's asking, it could be asking, what empathy do you want the reader to have? What do you want them to understand that they might know about you at this point? Um, and I think that's why that self-interview or that interview with someone else exercise can help you articulate where your motivations and drive comes from, and then translating that into a story. I love that. I think that was so well articulated. And Alina, you know, when you're talking about personal branding or kind of building this narrative for yourself, what are some channels or what are some tools that you often use? I know you're active on Instagram what are, and, and LinkedIn um, and you write a lot, but what, what are some best practices? What are some other things that you really use actively to kind of build your personal brand? And why is this important? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'll admit that I'm still mastering the art of building my personal brand. But one thing that I've done that's really helpful is I kind of run my life in mini sprints. That's what I like to call it, where I'll say to myself, I want to try out a new skill or build my brand around XYZ topic. And I'll just commit to creating content around that area and see what resonates. So I, for example, I decided I want to be more active on LinkedIn, but I'm not sure what kind of content people want to hear from me. I don't know how they would describe my personal brand. So I created a lot of different content about being a writer at Microsoft, about conversations that resonated with me. And in aggregate, after looking back, I started to analyze, you know, which posts are getting the most engagement or what kinds of questions am I receiving the most regularly? So for me, I know a big part of my personal brand is that I pitched my job at Microsoft. So I pitched it first as an intern position and then converted full time. And a lot of folks have expressed interest in understanding how to do that and strategies for doing so. So I kind of had to be able to put content out there um, and give myself permission to try things out, knowing that not everything would succeed. But then from there, I could kind of see what's resonating with people, what content is not really landing as much and that's okay, but how can I pivot? And so it is kind of a critical mass thing. I mean, I was creating a lot of content on LinkedIn and Instagram and Twitter and as a writer, and not everybody has time to try out everything, but figure out what's feasible for you, whether it's posting about, you know, the work that you do three times a week or identifying three to five tenants of your brand that you want to write or speak about and creating content around those areas and then seeing what's resonating or what kinds of questions you're getting regularly. I love that. And um, is there something called too much vulnerability? You know, oftentimes I feel like even I get stuck with that piece where I'm like, am I putting myself out there too much? What's yeah. a good balance? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that's something that I've thought about a lot, even... I think my Instagram, for example, is definitely a lot more personal. It's it's a much more well-rounded look at me, whereas my LinkedIn, for example, is more professional, so to speak. It's more about my job. And I think that's okay. It makes sense to share on the platforms that make the most sense for you. So if you have a personal Instagram where you might share not just your work, but your relationship, the challenges that you're going through, I don't think there's anything wrong with being more vulnerable there and then having your LinkedIn be more focused on your job. But I am trying to get out of that model of compartmentalizing my life, at least for me, because I fundamentally believe that I'm everything at once. You know, I don't check myself at the door when I walk into a company or into a room. And so the who I am, the things that I value and that are on my mind that might not be outside of work, those are just as important. But I will say that when you are vulnerable and you share parts of yourself, you are opening yourself up for people to ask about those things. So share what you can, but you can also set boundaries around 
what you're willing to talk about. So I've written a lot about being a queer Muslim woman because that's important to me, but a lot of that content is on Instagram versus LinkedIn. And I think that's okay because I've met so many folks who are inspired by my story, who feel a little bit less alone or in community. And I feel okay with having those stories there because I do want them to be out in the world. And if a future employer sees that, I would want them to know that that is who I am and to accept me. I love that. I think that I think all of us need to be doing more of that for sure. And I, and I think that's one thing about our community in particular that we are a diverse global community, and and we really celebrate that piece. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I do want to uh, give a quick shout out on that thought. Uh, you know, for those of you who are here, just to kind of speak about the uh, the current crisis which is happening in India. Uh, India is going through a second wave of COVID nineteen crisis. Um, and and if you do have the means, please do take a minute to read up on it and uh, donate if you can. Um, and I just wanted to put it out there. Uh, and and for those of you who are here and want to kind of speak to Alina, feel free to raise your hand, uh, and we'll be happy to kind of have you ask your questions directly. Uh, but there's a question which came in from Kathy, and she asks, uh, "Do you have any worksheets in crafting a storytelling uh, stories as such?" I mean, perhaps if you have any framework that you'd like to kind of share with us and we can share it, uh, that'll be great. Lena, do you want to talk about these? Yeah, so the question was like work streams for creating stories? Worksheets. Worksheets. Work sheet. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. I, I will probably have to dig some up. I know I have worksheets that I'll go through with clients for crafting their LinkedIn or their resume. So I have like a couple kind of like guiding questions and exercises, but I will say candidly for me, I'm not a very process oriented person. Um, I just kind of like to try things out and I've been telling stories for so long, I know what works for me. But I think a really simple framework that's pretty effective is defining the audience the purpose and the context of your piece. So I spoke a little bit about this, but even writing out, you know, who am I writing for? What is the purpose of this piece? Whether it's to drive sales, increase engagement, educate people, and where is the context where people will find this piece or that story? And even defining those things for yourself will help you make decisions further down the line. So if you are, let's say that you are a PM who wants to be a developer, and you're trying to tell the story of that transition. Maybe your audience would be folks who understand and value both disciplines, but are looking for folks who are more technical because that's the role that you want. And so when you're presenting your portfolio, for example, you would want to use pieces that highlight the fact that you have technical skills, that you understand constraints and understand how to build software engineering systems. It's been a while since I've taken a coding class, so forgive me if I don't know all the language. But the idea is that you you try to understand what your audience is looking for or who you're trying to appeal to and make decisions in your storytelling that gets you closer to that. And then, of course, iteration is such a key part. So whenever I write a story, I will get feedback from somebody that I really trust, and I will be specific about the things that I want feedback on. So if I'm writing, I wrote a Q&A with a creative director for a South Asian beauty brand, and I was getting feedback, I said, my goal is really to inspire other creatives and invite them to get started as a creative director. Are there clear calls to action? And am I outlining what this field really looks like? And so if I give somebody a really scoped question or source of feedback, then they can help me address that and move through that versus just saying, hey, can you give me feedback on that? So getting specific about the goal of the story and what you want to improve can go a really long way. I love that. And, and Arena, I think you touched upon this piece, which is building, um, you know, a brand uh, and branding yourself as such. But mm -hmm. uh, how important is storytelling and personal branding when you're trying to transition from either, let's say, early stage to a mid-stage career level yeah. or from mid-stage to a senior career level? I think the skill is pivotal, but to your, you know, from your experience, what what is something, why, why is this important? And um, how can someone really improve on that skill as such? Yeah, that's a great question. So a few months ago when I gave this talk, I remember I had just gotten promoted the day before. And I was explaining to them that storytelling is honestly a key part of why I got promoted to the next level. Because it's not just about 
doing great work, although of course that's important, but it's telling stories about the value of your work and who you're influencing. So whenever I would have one-on-ones with my manager, I would say, you know, my goal is to perform at the next level. What do you expect of me? And what do, what are leaders, you know, our skip, my manager's manager, what are they looking for? And so once he told me the skills that they value, what they want out of our work, I was able to craft emails and ensure that they were having visibility into the work I was doing. Um, And so that ensured that there was a really clear story that me, Alina, I was driving value and I was performing beyond my level. And so if somebody else is transitioning to the next stage of your career, you definitely want to be telling stories about yourself, about your impact, but you also need to find mentors and sponsors who can advocate for you when you're not in the room and articulate your value as well. Um, And so that's why it helps to have a sponsor who is in the decision-making room when promotions are brought up or, you know, raises are brought up that somebody can articulate your story as well and that it's in line with the work that you're doing. So definitely if getting promoted is on your mind, having a really clear story about why you deserve it and how you drive value is a really key part of that. I think very well said. And, you know, I think the other piece of it, just to kind of build on what you just mentioned, is that ultimately when you're going into those board meetings or connecting with anyone, they're all people. Everybody likes to listen right. to stories and, uh, you know, it, it just creates that connection. So definitely hone in on this skill. I think it's very, very important. Uh, Niku, I think you have a question that, that's here. Would you like to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? I, I do want to give the opportunity. I don't want to put you on the spot, but yes, I did want to sure. give you the opportunity. No, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I guess I could turn on my camera as well. Hi, Alina. Thank you for that talk. Of course. Um, I have a I have two questions, um, if that's okay. Um, first question is not as important as my second one. I'm spe- especially struggling with the second one. But the first question is, how do you use, I noticed in your LinkedIn mm-hmm. that you had the banner with your pic, well, with kind of your name, kind of a business card element there. Mm-hmm. Um, so what are kind of the tips that you have for using visual design elements in personal yeah. branding? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will say that I studied human-centered design and engineering, but I do not consider myself a graphic designer. I really wish I did. Um, but I think that there are some really key elements of design that anybody can practice. Um, and for me, that's having clear information architecture and presenting the information so people know who you are and have a call to action. So that banner I was able to create in Canva. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a free graphic design software. And there's tons of templates and examples that you can pull from. And the key there is really to just identify what the elements of your brand are. So for me, I mentioned that I'm a writer and a storytelling consultant because that's what I do. I know that those elements of my brand have landed well. Um, But even something as simple as having consistent colors, that kind of visual cue makes your work look more cohesive. So this graphic that you see on the slide about my consultation services, I pulled the hex codes that show up in my banner so that way there's a cohesive look and feel and those colors also show up on my LinkedIn, my portfolio, my Twitter banner. Um, And so even a simple principle of design is that consistency is key. You just have a couple elements that are showing up so that people know what to expect when they look at your profile. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Do I have time to ask the second question? Yeah, I think so. Awesome. Thanks. Um, So my second question is regarding um, any tips for people who have a hard time um, talking about their accomplishments or about the value that they bring. I I find this in myself and also in um, other women coworkers that I work with. Um, Sometimes I can feel like bragging, especially in interviews. Um, So do you have any experiences with that or any tips around that? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. I mean, I think... To be candid, I think I've reached the point where I I know what I do well, I guess. Like, I'm pretty early in my career, but there's elements that I feel like people have told me that they can count on me for that I've heard time and time again. And so I feel really confident articulating them in interviews. And so if it helps, um, maybe you're, you're like, oh, well, I feel like writing or marketing is my strength, but I don't know objectively. Can you draw on data or verbatim feedback and use that in an interview? So for example, if I'm explaining that I told I 
wrote a story that I was really proud of, maybe I can also bring in some of those objective metrics, saying that the story got 10,000 views, um, that the story got picked up by the at Microsoft handle and Kevin Scott, who's our CTO, and things like that where your work and its impact are speaking for itself. Um, and I mean, I know it can be, it's not something that you just casually bring up in conversation, I get that, but in the context of an interview where somebody wants to know the work that you do and what makes you successful, it's just knowing what data points are relevant to you and bringing them up. So for example, I recently interviewed for a different writing role and I shared that piece about the 10,000 views and being reshared, but I really wanted to be authentic to me. And so I said, you know, the most impactful part was getting a message from somebody that said, I don't often, I never really thought that Microsoft was doing such innovative work about sustainability. Like your work has me so excited about this company. And for the first time, like I could see myself working there. Um, and that, that interaction meant so much more to me than the views or the engagement numbers. And when I'm in interviews, I share that because that's what was really personally impactful for me. So I think it's a balance, right? Sharing your accomplishments objectively through data or verbatim feedback, but then also sharing moments that feel really authentic to you. And then when you find something in the middle, I think it doesn't feel like you're bragging. It just feels like you're you're being honest about what you've done and what it means to you. That's really good advice. I never thought about the combo and kind of complimenting each other, but yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I think we have another question from Chizova. I hope I said your name right. I'm sorry if I butchered it. Hi, I'm sorry. I can't turn on my video. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. I said the background. Okay. So um, I have um, three questions. They're very short. So the first one, you said that you studied human centric, something in, 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 in college. I wanted to know, do you have advice on short programs or courses that someone can learn or study with regards to emotional storytelling? Oh, that is a good question. Mm -hmm. so the second one is, I'm trying to transition into the tech space mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I, and I want to start as a PM. How can I write my bio in such a way that recruiters can even though I do not have the experience, but I can still sell myself. And then the third one is, you said that, that sometimes you get like less favorable um, feedbacks, like you're unfocused. How did that affect your self-esteem as a woman in the tech space, especially since that the tech space is occupied by mostly men? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for the first one in terms of boot camps or courses, I will say I'm not an expert in that because I've never done one, but um, if I find, I will take a look after and see if I can find anything. I know that there are quite a few, um, there's like UX Collective, there's a couple boot camps around design and storytelling. I know um, Georgetown has like a, a virtual master's. There's definitely programs out there. I can't speak to how good they are. Um, so I would say if you're able to tap into your network, I know Products by Women has like a Facebook group. There are other ones as well. That could be a great question to pose and see if there's folks who can vouch for the programs that they've done. Um, for the second one of advocating for being a PM if you're not in that space, I would say that it's important to highlight your transferable skills. So I've talked to a couple folks who are in your position. And I think for me, at least a PM is all about building relationships and advocating for the feature or the thing that you're developing. So can you talk about the way that you've done that? How do you influence other people, especially from other disciplines? Or how do you advocate for something to be created and for budget or headcount? And are there ways that you've done that before? So you probably have those skill set in some ways. It's just a matter of shifting the language. Um, a quick tip that I'll use is that if there's a PM role at a company that you like, looking up the job description and seeing if any of that language can be used to a apply the work that, to the work you do now, whether it's building relationships, influencing stakeholders, prioritizing, um, that language shows up in a PM role, but it's not the only way. And I'm sure that you do that in ways now. And then for the last one, um, yeah, I'm no stranger to negative feedback. I think as a writer, everybody can write. Everyone has the ability to write. So everybody has an opinion about what makes writing good or not. Um, and so whenever I receive negative feedback or someone tells me, you know, you're interested in too many things, 
I I kind of have learned whose opinion matters the most to me, if that makes sense. So I've definitely had folks tell me, you know, you can't do everything that you do, right? That's too many different things. You can't be a writer and a storyteller and a speaker and a video producer. And to that, I say, well, actually I am. Like I, I do all of those things and I'm grateful to have found a team that lets me explore. Um, and so what matters most to me is that I have areas of expertise and depth, but I also have a lot of breath in my experience. <clears throat> And then if I get feedback from somebody who is kind of questioning, you know, my validity to be there, I will ask, can you tell me more about where that comment comes from and try to understand their intention? Um, and so asking people to explain, like you mentioned this, what does that mean? That goes a long way. Well, you know, um, well, of course. <laughs> Thank you so much for your question. And, you know, I do want to be mindful of your time. It is 8.32 p.m. ET here. Uh, thank you so much for coming in here and giving this amazing, incredible talk. And for everybody who's here, please do connect with Lena. I did drop her LinkedIn earlier. Um, I've also dropped a bunch of information. We do have an incredible event, which is coming up tomorrow with a PM at Google. Uh, she's going to be talking about how to build products and how to use skills as a product manager to, you know, build amazing, incredible products as well. Um, with that, Alina, if you do want to say some parting words before we leave uh, and how anybody can connect with you, I know you've mentioned you're on Instagram, LinkedIn, and what's the best way? Perhaps yeah. a good refresher. Yeah, I mean, I think part of being a writer is that I'm always on the social channels. So if you find me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, I'm not very good at Twitter, but I'm working on it. Um, and if you ever have any follow up questions, just know that you can always reach out to me. I love supporting folks in storytelling and I can send some resources that they're also linked at the end of this slide. So. So if you get started, you need some guiding questions. I've created some content and I also have linked to some of my favorite articles. But I think the most important thing with storytelling is to start. I know that you all have a story to tell and it's just a matter of committing to that vulnerability and putting yourself out there. And every time I've done it, I haven't regretted it. So I encourage you to take that leap. Thank you so much, Alina. And and with that, I think I'm going to close out the event. Thank you again on Wednesday to come and like come here and inspire each of us, really. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. And I'm excited to see if something resonated with you. Please send me it in a message so I know. Um, it's always helpful for me to get that feedback. I'll take it seriously, as I mentioned. Um, but thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. For sure, and if you take a minute to read all the uh, the incredible sweet messages that have come in to tell, you know talk about how how they love this event, yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> See you. Bye. Bye.